welcome to the Authentic Man podcast. I am your host, David Chambers. This is a podcast for men who want more and less from life. More deep connection, more emotional intelligence, more self-awareness and more great sex. And less. Less heartache, less conflict, less overthinking and less stress. Creating dating lives, sex lives and relationships that are incredible and authentic. My deepest goal is that you, the listener, can take away what you hear in this podcast and apply it to your life so that you can experience greater happiness, transformational growth, deeper relationships and profound sexual intimacy. I believe that as men, we are capable of so much more depth than we are shown or led to believe. So join me as we get deep into this. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome back to another episode of the Authentic Man podcast. I'm your host, David Chambers. Um, yeah, I had a week off last week um, for the podcast, mainly because I was moving to Madeira basically. Um, and I was just really full of stuff. So this episode wouldn't go out last week, but it's going out this week now because, you know, it's okay to just miss something. <laughs> it's quite a, a moment for me because, uh, you know, I get into this idea that I have to put out every week. If I don't, then it means this, it means that. And I just thought, you know, I don't need to, nothing goes wrong if I don't. But this episode is and a wonderful episode. I've, I've listened to it because I always listen to the episode and edit them. And Speaking to an amazing man, Habib Kande, who's a, a sexologist, an historian, um, an accountant, uh, you know, an expert in female pleasure, as well as uh, the technique kunyasa, which we talk about. But this is an incredible conversation because there's two men talking about the importance of of men looking at their own issues, the the, the problems with male bravado, with you know, might want to call that toxic masculinity, um, the importance of learning about female pleasure and centering sex on female pleasure and so forth and discipline and, and all these things and how men talk to other men about sex. And we just really weaved in and out of these topics, almost making it very difficult to give it a, a title because there's so much we talked about. And it's an incredible conversation. Like I really enjoy talking to Habib, a man who is like an absolute expert in his field, you know. And how often do you, you know, you come across a man who's an expert in female pleasure and a, and a black British man as well with that, actually. I think he's very rare and he's just very down to earth, um, very funny. And he asked some wonderful questions towards the end. Like, you know, I know it's a longer episode, but I really would recommend listening towards the end of the episode because we really get into some some really juicy questions around why men struggle in relationships, how, you know, the media portray men and relationships and, and how that is actually damaging men. But we talk a lot about, you know, we start talking about some stuff around advice and how bad advice hurts our relationships and, you know, the dangers of taking advice from the wrong people. And we talk a lot about prioritizing sexual pleasure for women, but why it's so important for not just for men, not, not sorry, not just for women, but also why it's so important for men and what men get out of it. And also we talk a lot about how men get their validation from their sexual experiences, not from the women they have sex with, but from actually the the men that they know in their lives and why that is hurting a lot of man, men's relationships and sex lives. And we also really get into, obviously as two men who are sex educators, is the importance of continually learning about sex. It's not a one and done thing. It's not, oh, I've slept with lots of women so that I know about sex. It's actually why you should be really steeping yourself in learning about you know, sex and sexual experiences, the different people you talk to and communicating that. And, you know, I'm sure if you're listening to this, you, 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 you are along with that and you want to know more, but this is sort of episode you really worth sharing with, with some other men in your life, whether you're a man or a woman listening to this, who are maybe not so well versed in this stuff, because there's a lot to get out of this and candid conversation from the two of us about our own experiences and, and also our experiences with men. Um, but yeah, I would highly recommend checking out the, the links and heading over to, um, Habib, he's got multiple books as he talks about a lot about erotology and, and female pleasure and so forth. So I really highly recommend those. Some about race as well, which which I haven't touched myself, but I, I'm sure they're wonderful, wonderful reads. Before we get into the episode, um, just let you know about a couple of things. First of all, the events. I've got three events coming up, four events, sorry, coming up actually in the in the not too distant future. You know, one of those is 
uh, I've got two Tantra events. I'm running with, with Awesome, a wonderful partner, on the 28th of November. Um, that one's for um, couples, and then we've got one for singles. That is in um, the 9th of December, I think that is. And then we've got our How to Create a Conscious Relationship workshop as well that we're running on the on the 12th of December. So that's, you know, that's a really good one, the How to Create Conscious Relationships workshop, because it's just really important in terms of, you know, some of the things we even cover today in this episode about communication and so forth is like super important in terms of kind of communicating well, communicating strongly. Um, so, yeah, it's really an important thing to 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 come together with. And the other workshop I have is is a workshop called Being Authentically Attractive, which is on the 9th of December as well, um, for, you to, for the guys and girls, actually. This is a one for, for all genders. It's just, you know, how to really show up in that kind of authentic whole way so you can attract the sort of partner you want. Because, you know, that's a really important thing to to be working with and working on. So that's most of it for today. Um, if, you know, some of the topics we cover in today's episode, especially for the men listening, if it's something you want more help with, please reach out to me for, for coaching and having a conversation about that because these are the things I'm deeply passionate about, as you will really hear inside of the episode. But without further ado, I'll leave you to jump into it. Ciao, ciao. All right, ladies and gentlemen, back with a, a wonderful episode, an episode I've been anticipating for, for some time. After the gentleman I am talking to today, I came across his Instagram post, Instagram account, and was just loving his, his conversations around sex and female pleasure. And and I think one of the things I particularly enjoyed was uh, his screenshotting of questions he gets in his DMs and then asking people what they thought and then just allowing the comments to rumble on, just we say. Um, it's just really beautiful to see how... Um, to see another black man talking about sexual pleasure, I feel like it's something that I don't see so often in the UK, especially. Um, so I'm really, really happy to speak to Habib Akande. Hi, David. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. How, How are, are you? you? Thank you for inviting me on your platform. I'm looking forward to this discussion as well. Yeah, yeah. How are you doing today? Very well. You actually threw me off, to be honest, because... Um, a number of people have actually said that about, you know, the fact that they they find it quite interesting, the different stories that I post in people's comments. And that's why um, I've only started posting those comments the last five months. And it's the reaction um, because mm -hmm. I think it's eye opening, not only because and the reason why I do it is because a to show um, this might sound not really good to say or might be so um, not politically correct, but I think I don't think. Good, good advice is not common. And I think a lot of people give bad advice, especially in the realm of sex and relationships. And it just shows that how quick people are to pass judgment, mm. how quick people are to, you know, give ill advice advice when they don't even know the full facts or not even trying to probe or trying to understand. It's just like, get rid of him, divorce, leave him. He's this, he's that. And it's very, and it's, and again, some people might not like me saying this, but a lot of the advice and the comments and anyone who goes on my page is definitely very um, slanted towards one gender compared to the other. So, as in, the man is always generally at fault. Um, if a man is doing wrong, then obviously the man's to blame and he doesn't have to satisfy his female partner. If the woman um, is complaining, then again, the man's at fault. If the man's complaining, he's not a real man and or maybe he's gay or maybe he's this. And, and it's just very... And it, it, again, for if anything, it really highlighted why it's important that there are men spaces for men to speak openly and what happens is that oftentimes when I post um, comments about and I, again I'll, I'll make this anonymous so if someone will ask me a question or query about a sexual problem or relationship dilemma and I'll give them my advice what I can privately and then sometimes I'll post um, some of their messages to see what people's responses are and ask them what are people's thoughts are for people that follow me and I've noticed that it, like 80 percent of the comments are about the female women that follow me mm. and the men that will comment generally will comment in my inbox privately mm. because sometimes when men have commented they have been slated like some of the women <laughs> so it does have and for me again it just shows why there's a reluctance a for you know men to kind of speak and you know show their vulnerability or speak about some of the issues that they're going through rightly or wrongly within a relationship or even to offer some advice um and then b also why it's important that there are 
Um, and I think it's important, like, and it's good to see another black man, and I'm unapologetic in saying that another black man, sex educator and relationship expert speaking about these issues because we don't really see many, well, I don't see many, especially straight black men speaking about sex uh, and relationships um, in a way that men can understand and relate to. It's all well and good saying something to um, pander to women or to say something that women appreciate, but saying something in a, in a way that I think men can relate to, I think that's something that's definitely necessary because whilst I do speak and my, a lot of my work is focused around um, female pleasure and prioritizing women's pleasure and teaching men the importance of satisfying um, their female partners, I also feel it's important that I'm speaking to men in a way that men understand. Um, so mm. it's, it's interesting that although my, a lot of my work is about women's pleasure, it's actually directed to men but a lot of women will comment or feel that it's a women's only platform. And I've had even some women have said that telling me that this is a woman's only platform or why am I posting this or, and especially with some, and I like to entertain as well as educate. And I think with a number of men, I like to, um, cause I think again, especially as men and my platform is, is for adults generally over the age of like 20, 22 or, and upwards. Um, and a lot of men I find that of those ages, we know a bit, or we know a bit, and it's not like we want to be schooled or someone lecturing us how you should behave. So the way I try to pass some information is informally, and that could be by way of memes, by way of asking or posing questions for people to think about, not where I'm kind of educating this is what, or lecturing them, this is what you should and shouldn't do kind of thing. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so that's the way I kind of, and that's the way I was taught when I was really young um, from my older cousins and brothers and, and uncles. So it's it's by learning, by osmosis, by people's behavior, people around me, people not telling me this is necessarily, you've got the principles in terms of how you're supposed to behave, but in terms of how you action it, obviously it varies. And, um, and especially when people are passing knowledge, I think it's important that it's done. But it's good if it's done in an, in an informal setting where the recipient feels comfortable to take what that message is being put across. And sometimes the, I'm not going to act like I don't pass judgment because I know it's very common nowadays to say that I don't pass. I think we all pass judgment in some shape or form. Um, and I'm not going to act like I'm completely objective because I've got my biases and my subjectivities, but I will try and a lot of information I'll put out for people to think and ponder and choose what's right for you. If some of you disagree, you, you leave it. Is that there's a saying, and my aunt always used to say that, eat the fish and spit out the bones. So you take the good from something and that which you dislike. And that's my that's always been my attitude. But sometimes some people, if I say something that might be perceived to be misogynistic or in bad taste or um not really or triggering, I try not to think about although I'm just empathetic to people's situation, if I'm always thinking about everyone's situation, I wouldn't post anything or comment on anything because it might not go down well with, with someone. But um yeah, it's been a journey to be fair. The last, you know, two to three years really been because I'm last two two to three years I've really been emphasizing a lot about and about the importance of women's pleasure and doing webinars and workshops, not only for men but also for women as well. But it's interesting the responses I receive from men compared to the responses I receive from women. So, but yeah, yeah, yeah I have a one of the things I really saw because I've looked through the the comments on those those particular posts. And what I'm always really aware of is a lack of compassion from people. There's a huge lack of compassion for, you know, if it's a man, you know, for example, a man who's not having sex with his wife, there it's just like people, they basically project all their own views upon men onto the person and, and kind of respond from that place. I've seen, and I've read through them and been like, ah, oh. it's just like you said, people are like, just leave him, he's useless, divorce him, you know, that sort of thing. And you're like, wait a minute, you know, this isn't the full picture. This you're giving this advice, and this is a sort of bad advice that often, um, you know, we see from like family and friends. Sometimes it really causes harm to our relationships. No, yeah, most definitely, and it's um, a lot of men are suffering in silence. And again, I'm because I, I can imagine some when I say this, especially when I've said this in like mixed gendered settings or um, women only seminars. It's like. I've a number of times women will roll their eyes or like yeah really it's not that bad and like you said there's, there does appear to be a lack of compassion and empathy towards um, men and this there's a lot of misconceptions that people have and sexual myths they held about men like men are mm. always ready for sex men mm. always want to have sex every time and if they don't either it's because they're not attracted to women or something's wrong with inherently wrong with them it's, it's like 
there's no, there's never even a, um, a space even open up. Okay, maybe he's suffering from sexual anxiety. Maybe he's got some stresses. Maybe he's got some medical or psychological issues. That that space is, is not created. And even to be fair, in men only spaces as well, because we I'm generalizing here, but a lot of times, you know, we like we've got our bravado. We like to laugh and joke. We don't allow those spaces where men can kind of speak openly and honestly. And um, I'll be even in my personal. Um, friendship groups how we disclose our issues it is also done in the form of laughing and joking so we know we don't always necessarily kind of open ourselves up because there are some friends who are more welcoming and understanding and can kind of give you advice and others who just like make a, a song and dance out of it or, and others that would just dismiss you but that's just again i, I think whilst i think that definitely more spaces are needed to be created for men but at the same time correct spaces because not everyone is going to be allow themselves to be open and vulnerable with everyone because if you don't because it can be used against you as well and as much as you know i hear a lot about people saying you know it's important for men to be emotionally available and vulnerable that's all well and good but if you know that that can be used against you whether in a relationship or in life you're not going to open yourself up to be to be attacked that way and so it's just something that I try to open up male insecurities because we've all got insecurities put in a way that men can digest and relate to and to show that it's very common. It's not uncommon like for people to have sexual issues or sexual concerns. And that's kind of like whether you're dealing with porn addiction, even though that's a problematic term, you know, whether it's addiction or compulsive sexual behavior or whether it's, um, you know, unwanted desire or whether it's whatever it is everyone has or mismatches like everyone is going through something you know whether it's by themselves or we're in the context of a relationship but again those discussions aren't really had um and there's great work that's done you know in terms of empowering women and talking about women's rights to sexual pleasure and consent which is good um but how to do it in a way where men can feel part of the conversation that's something which um i'm conscious of although i don't direct my messaging just to men if that makes sense so i involve and again most of my work if not all of it is obviously in the, in the context of a heterosexual relationship it's speaking to men or speaking to women but with the other gender in mind as well if that makes sense so that's um, kind of like no no i um i guess most of my content is aimed at men it's consumed heavily by women because women are always drawn to a man who is trying to speak from a place of care, love, compassion. And I find that men, that, you know, some men resonate with what I'm saying, they understand. Um, and like you said, when it comes to sexual difficulties, men don't have any safe places to go. Like I run a couple of workshops where I start off the workshop by talking about my own difficulties. And as the workshop goes on, men share more openly and honestly when I when I'm like, you know, this is normal, you're not alone. And then when they hear one man say, you know, I'm suffering from uh, erectile dysfunction or sometimes I, um, I have premature ejaculation. And then another man says it and they're like, wow, I'm not alone. There's another five, 10, 15 men here speaking about this. And they start to talk really freely. And it's very healing for men to, to be in such a space. Yeah, I, 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 I've seen that from my own experience. And um, my approach is similar and somewhat different in the sense that um how how do i do it so sometimes i give i don't really go to sometimes i give personal stories but a lot of times for me because even with like problems or to me that's just part and parcel of life and i've always kind of had that mindset as in so if for example excuse the language like you bust too quick right mm. That is part and part of sex. Like anyone that's having relations with him sometimes or performance anxiety or you meet in a, you know, maybe someone that you've been interested in for long, you've been courting for a period of time and then, you know, you've been given all of the jazz, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And then <laughs> halfway into the first minute of, not even the first song, before you even get to the chorus, you're thinking, you're thinking <laughs> oh no, that's it. And you're struggling. So you're thinking, okay, what am I going to do? So then you start to pretend you feign an injury. Maybe you'd be like, oh, I'm hearing someone at the door. You do whatever you need to do. To <laughs> We've all done that. Or, you know, like, or you're like, oh, what's that? You know, you, and again, and I say it in a way that if, if, if a man has been there or they thought about it or they understand it, so it's more, okay, I can relate to it. Or it's just even entertaining. And some women have, that when I've said this, like horrified. And it's just like, I just want him to tell me. if he, It's like, we've got our ego. And sometimes we want to preserve our sexual ego. Now, someone can diagnose that and be like, oh, you've got a 
problem and maybe you've suffered from premature ejaculation. It's like, well, if you want to diagnose it, that's up to you. But it's something that people at different stages have had issues sexually, like we've had issues with our health wise, but it's just how you deal with that. And then with a number of men, if you know, for example, you know, you're going to bust too quick, you know, release too quick, you might be like, okay, so I again preserve my ego and I still feel like I'm the man with her. Let me just go down and give her oral. You know, so we mm. do all of these tactics and what a lot of women fail to realise when I'm speaking to the women who attend my workshops is that I know sex shouldn't be bad performance, but for a lot of men it is. Because yeah. if it was just about the quickest to ejaculation or the quickest to come, we, we would win every time. Every time. But if it's about mutual pleasure, if it's about making sure she's satisfied, then there has to be an element where we're intentionally delaying our pleasure and our gratification for her. Mm. And that's something that, again, I, I think a lot of women do not realise that. Again, if it was just, if I was purely thinking about my pleasure, you was thinking about your pleasure, I would be done and like, you know, I'm finished within a couple of minutes. So no, that's just, that's just, a re- no, that's just, a re- and there's nothing wrong with that. And, and that's why even traditionally in the ancients, they also taught, teach men the importance of prioritising women's pleasure just because naturally the way Male, the male sexual response differs to the female sexual response. And again, mm. I'm all for, you know, appreciating the differences between the genders, but then obviously understanding how we can come to a situation where we can be, still could be compatible and have a mutually sexually satisfying experience. Um, and again, I just try and do it in a way where it's more comfortable maybe for people to digest. Um, and again, some people might feel uncomfortable with that approach because again, it can, it can come across as if, I'm making light of a serious issue, but that's kind of like my character. Um, and again, that's just how I kind of was taught. So we have a lot of issues, whether it's erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, um, sex addiction, all of these issues, I try and see the humour in it, in a sense of this is how you can kind of overcome it. Because even when we speak about sex, it's, it's a form of adult play. And if you can't laugh and joke and talk with your partner, then for me, yes, it's good to go to a coach or counsellor, but First and foremost, you need to be able to have that comfortability where you can open yourself up to your partner. And that's something that I've noticed both with men and women. People feel very uncomfortable to speak about sex and their and how they're feeling with their partner. And it's all well and good. And again, this might be controversial to say, but it's all well and good empowering women to speak about sex. But if you're just speaking about sex to your girlfriends, but you haven't got the vocabulary to speak to it and open yourself up and say, listen, and not only just to listen to respond, but to listen to hear and take in what your male partner is saying, then it's not effective. And I would say that a lot of people, both men and women, are can communicate, but they can't communicate effectively. And I think that's one of the problems. So understanding, you know, generally from the woman's perspective, how she views things, and again for women to kind of understand things from the men's man's perspective and how he view, views things, and also to appreciate that generally we use different type of language when we're speaking about our sexual experiences. And it's not again as long as you know, someone is not speaking about something in a demeaning or harmful way. It's just that we use words differently. So whilst if I'm speaking to primarily a female audience, I'm using words like vulnerability and insecurity and opening up and healing, and that resonates with women. If I speak to a lot of men only audiences, it's like, okay, you're just, you're just, I don't understand what you're talking about, but we Mm -hmm. still have those, we understand, but we just use a different language. And that's, that's something that's quite difficult. I've, I've realized to try and navigate when I've had, when I held mixed gender settings that I would naturally then just maybe speak as if I'm speaking to the women audience, but mm. then the, I will lose the men because then it's like, you're making us feel as if I'm not emotionally available. I'm emotionally literate. And you're using all of these nice words that I understand what you're saying, but just break it down the same way that I can understand if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So that's why I was like, okay, let me then change it up and then, when I'm doing my work only settings, I'll speak more informally a way that men can understand me. And when I'm speaking to women, I'll be using same same message, but it's just the language is, is slightly different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I do. I totally get you. Um, the need for that because, like you said, what I see more and more is that we all want to really talk about sex. You know, we want to talk about sex. We want to have more sex, but we've been told and we've been conditioned to. It, there being something wrong with it so it leads us to struggle to communicate and like you said there's so much amazing female empowerment work happening right I really love to see it I really feel joy when I see it but I think as you said there's it's real, all, all well and good for a group of women to sit in a circle and go ah oh, let's talk about sex for two hours um, but they can't go and do that with their partners and then on the flip side for men 
what we what I'm seeing is men struggle to talk about sex together. They also struggle to talk about it in partnership as well. So, Habib, I think the question I think is a very interesting answer is is how did you come to do this work in you know how did you come to do the work that you do today? Um. So where can I start? So I. Uh... It's a good question. So I, after I graduated from university, not that I'm going to tell my whole life story, but after I graduated from university, I went to Egypt because I wanted to further my um, understanding about Islam and Arabic. Um, whilst I was out there, I came across a number of um, books in Arabic written by Egyptian and um, Arab um, scholars of the past from like the 9th century up until the 16th century about sex and intimacy. And I was, I'm a Muslim, by the way, but I was quite surprised because these were, um, well-renowned, prominent scholars, religious scholars, speaking about the importance of, you know, female sexual pleasure and how a man's supposed to treat his woman in the bedroom. And again, from my, you know, in the UK, I'd never come across such works. And I thought, okay, this is really interesting because, like I said, I'd not come across like where religious pe people are speaking so openly about sex. In my family, so obviously I'm originally from Nigeria, it's very common for people to kind of speak about relationships and stuff. So from a cultural perspective, Speaking about sex, and again, from my, you know, whether I'm hearing it from my um, older brother or cousins or uncles, some were Muslim, some were Christian, because culturally, very open to kind of speak about these type of topics. But within a religious setting, it was something that I never really heard about, came across until I came across these works. So then I thought it might be interesting to um, maybe start translating some of these works or make them available to the English speaking world, because the same way I was intrigued and fascinated by it, I knew that there would be people that probably would be intrigued mm -hmm. by it. And then I went about um, writing um, a book called The Taste of Honey, which was about sexuality and erotology. Erotology is, um, like you could say, it's a predecessor of sexology, which is a science that concentrates on the study of sexual desire and sexual behavior, which looks at sexual attitudes, the philosophy of the sex, and things like that. So, so, so like the Karma Sutra is. is Eratology from a Hindu perspective. And then you got mm. Arab and Muslim scholars writing about eratology from Islamic perspective. So I wanted to write a book and kind of revive, you could say, eratology um, from an Islamic perspective, especially for people in the English speaking world. That came out in 2015. Um, that was my fourth book. Um, it wasn't as well received as my first book. My first book was about race and Isla in, in Islamic history. Um, and I kind of left on a back burner and then I went on to um, write a book about Brazil and the history of black people and West Africans in Brazil. Mm. And whilst I was out there, I came across uh, a couple of people, met a couple of women and they were like, they were interested in um, FEMA Orgasm Day, which is obviously mm. reaching from Brazil. And I also received a message from someone that read one of my books asking me, why didn't I write about Kunyaza? Because I wrote a book, my third book was about African erotology. So I wrote a book about Islamic erotology and I wrote another book about African erotology. And then someone said, why don't you write a book about, Kuny why didn't you mention Kunyaza in your book about African erotology? And I was like, what's Kunyaza? And then, um, and then I did my Googles like anyone would and then I came across <laughs> this wonderful, you know, um, practice, this rich culture, which is, you know, very orientated and dedicated to women's pleasure and this rich history in Rwanda and East Central Africa where this cultural practice and this technique that's de where men are taught from a relatively young age, the importance of satisfying women in the bedroom. And it's got this reputation of helping women square orgasms and achieve a multiple climax and all the rest of it. So I was, I was fascinated by it, especially given that it was an African practice and it's something mm. that, and I noticed from my previous studies that I will hear about, you know, the contributions that Arabs have made, the contributions that ancient Indians had made, the contributions that, ancient Chinese, even Europeans towards human sexuality and all of these things, which is great. But I was struggling to find the positive contributions that black and African people have made towards hum, um, human sexuality. And generally mm. when people speak about sex studies um, in, in an African context, it's either talking about FGM or, you know, domestic violence and things like that. So I wanted to kind of, again, highlight the positive contributions that black people have made. So when I came across this Kinyaza, um, tradition I then saw that it was um, there was a director that was making a film about Kunyaza which was um, Olivier Jordan who's who made um, Sacred Water so I reached out to him at the time he put me in contact with a couple of people from Rwanda and I was spoke, speak, spoke to a couple of people out there and some sexologists 
And then I spoke to one of my friends who's from Uganda. And I was like, this practice is, is, is common in your country. How come you, don't, you didn't tell me about this? And he was saying, oh, yeah, yeah. It's you know, one of those secrets. And then all of a sudden, I'm just hearing all of these things. And even one girl that I was seeing, but she was from Kenya, she kind of told me about it. And I was like, how come you didn't tell me about it? She said, oh, if we got married, I'd have told you. I was like, well, okay, it's one of those ones. So <laughs> it's something which um, I was like, okay, this would be very interesting. And there wasn't a book in English. There's a book in German and French which I read and that someone was helping me translate, but my book is like the first book in English dedicated not only to the culture, cultural practice, but also the tradition behind it and um, to celebrate the, the men and women, especially the women sex educators that teach it and, the, and emphasize the importance of female pleasure. So I, again, the book was, I wanted to also address some of the stigma associated around um, female sexuality, especially female ejaculation and squirting. Because in the Western context, it's kind of seen as oh, it's, it's urine, it's disgusting, and there's a lot of shame attached towards like women's um, sexual experiences. Which, mm-hmm. from a, even from my own personal experiences, I didn't really understand it. Now, personally speaking, I'm not going to act like I'm this enlightened, um, moral, upright individual. I was a bit of a scumbag in my early days, and uh, that's something <laughs> which. Um, and people find that quite difficult to believe. And I always try, especially when I'm speaking to women, that being a, like, so I was very reckless in terms of like, womanizing and sleeping around and saying what I needed to say to get what I wanted, even though I knew it was inherently wrong. So I'm not going to act like I was in ignorance. And then as soon as I was enlightened, then I started, no, it's like I was very selfish. The same way, and, and, and when people talk about education, I always say that, yes, education is important, but character is just as important because you can be, I can be very educated and know, what a man needs to do in order to turn a woman on it doesn't mean that i'll treat her well it doesn't mean i won't lie Mm. to her so this idea that education in and of itself is enough to make men good lovers and good companions and good husbands that's not that's not enough because some people can use it for their own advantage from their various reasons and that's the reality and that's something that i'm well aware of so and not to say that i'm this upstanding citizen but i'm definitely much better than i was previously if that makes sense so um, yeah, so for me, again, when I came across the Kunyaza and then when it came out in 2018, it did really well in terms of sales-wise. Um, and then I got contacted by someone from the BBC producer, read it, wanted to like make a documentary about it. So they came to one of my um, workshops, which they filmed, and then they made the documentary, which came out last year, May, it's done really well, it's like over 12 million viewers and yeah just a lot again for me it's like okay why didn't I get all of this attention with a taste of honey (laughs) Mm -hmm. and that was because like we mentioned offline um was because I I noticed that especially within the Muslim community that if I speak about sex intimacy relationships like you could say within Islamic context or even just put Islam or religion or Muslim there a lot of people feel um reluctant to kind of like listen or to kind of engage with that content whereas if I kind of make out like I'm speaking from a not necessarily a secular perspective but a non-religious just speaking about this cultural tradition I think more people are more comfortable to kind of like um, read it and kind of engage with it and it's quite funny because The Taste of Honey was intentionally written for a Muslim audience whereas Kunyaza was more general it wasn't for Muslims it wasn't for black people Africans were just general just like talking about this cultural practice and the Muslim community has responded much more favorably to Kunyaza and all of a sudden it's like now they're willing to kind of engage with me when previously, when I wanted to speak about the importance of female pleasure within an Islamic context, there was a lot of resistance, both from men and women, which is again, very um, interesting for me, but it just shows that there's a lot of misconception that people have even about sex and sexuality when it comes to religion. But if you mention spirituality, or culture they're more welcoming to that so even like like I was speaking before about how we message things like when you're speaking to men and women you might change your approach even when you're speaking to faith people of faith even they might be more reluctant to kind of digest something if they think it comes from religious sources whether it's from the bible the quran or what have you um and I always use um Dr Gary Chapman's work as a classic example everyone knows about the five love languages everyone yeah. appreciates everyone takes up and everyone uses it as like it's the gospel he's a christian pastor he's been teaching mm-hmm. 
about and he and his views and his beliefs is intertwined into that book the same as the Kama Sutra is from a Hindu perspective but people again because I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with religion they even want to dissociate religion from some products or some pieces of work or if their religion isn't mentioned then they're more comfortable to digest it because of maybe because some people have some hang-ups when in, in regards to sex and religion for different reasons so because of that if the ultimate message is the importance of female pleasure, women's sexual satisfaction, I don't always then maybe put up front that like religion, the influence of religion or, or whatever, because like I said, there'll be some reservations I've noticed from people. Mm -hmm. I guess because, you know, so many of us have had some sort of religious upbringing that's, you know, caused us some discomfort in some way, you know, mm -hmm. I spoke last week of a woman who had gone through kind of Christian deconstruction and soon as we see something we're like it's about the religion but it's also then about a subject which we are often not just we taught we are taught that it is wrong and bad in some way right a lot of the time somewhere we get this conditioning whether that's directly from religion or from from culture or from family so then when you put those two things together there's just like a just lot of a lot of resistance for us yes most definitely but i i still feel not yeah even to like I, I still feel I, I'm trying to understand why people can be they can understand like for example even if someone's come from or had a difficult upbringing or situation with religious person or religious upbringing to then think that all religion is, is bad and everything that what religion teaches is not beneficial but you wouldn't adopt that same standard to anything else and everything mm -hmm. else because there's bad eggs in every situation in every yes. cult, cultural tradition spirituality tradition even secular tradition why is it we adopt that when it's with religion? Or because I've had a bad experience with a religious person, all religious people are bad. And I just don't, I've never really understood that. But then at the same time, those very same people will benefit from some of the fruits of religion when it suits them. Mm. Mm. Exactly. But they'll just repackage it and say it's spirituality. It's this, it's not religion. It's you. So it, I, again, that's, but again, I, that's, that, that'll be a, another probably 20, 30 years study to try and understand that. That's why, okay, I understand where we are. Then it's a case of, okay, if you just want to still get the message across, how do you do it in the most effective way? And if it means by not necessarily um, mentioning religion, then that's fine. The same way when I speak to some of my friends, obviously that are not Muslim or religious, if I were to mention a quote from the Bible, they don't want to hear it. But if I mention that same quote from Jay-Z or Nas, they would listen to it, even though <laughs> they might have got that quote from the Bible. I'm being... No, it's true. There's a lot of like, I was, I'm a big hip hop fan, but a lot of the verses and stuff, they'll say, oh, that's brilliant. That's so amazing. And it's like, that's from the Bible. That's the parable from the Bible, what have you. And again, it's just that people have this disconnect or they want to dissociate anything to the religions that I can't benefit from it. So, Yeah, yeah, I hear that. I want to pick up on um, one thing you said about education, actually, around uh, men. And it's, it's also from my, my personal experience. You talked about character. And actually, yeah, I really resonate with that. It's important for us to, for men to work on their character because you can teach a man how to be really good in bed, right? And I feel that when I was probably in my mid-20s, due to just spending a lot of time with women and actually asking them what they enjoy and what they like, I started to learn quite quickly what women enjoyed because I took the time to care. But then I also see that I used that um, irresponsibly because I knew that if we spend a night together in bed, you would enjoy it so much that you will want to come back again. You're going to want to enjoy what you had again because, but then it also meant that I was able to, a bit like how you said, you not necessarily treat women as well as you should do because you almost had like a bit, you, you'll feel like you have a bit of a power over them. But it took me some time to realize the, the harmful effects, not just to women, but also to myself from, from doing that. And I think that's something that men are not always so conscious of when they are kind of dealing with the opposite sex. I mean, that... <laughs> What you said is deep um, and very profound. And what I got from that, and th th again, it's, it's very hard to explain to people who lack character and morality. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is because as the great person is it from Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's very true. Now, if you're conscious of that, like you know that, okay, I know I've got this power. I've got this, I know how to treat a woman in bed. I know how to make her do this and do it. I feel X, Y, and Z, right? Yes, in the, initially that feels great. But if you know, like you said, if you're going to engage in relationships with certain women and 
because they're going to have these great experiences with you, they're now going to be even more attached to you, but that's not really what you want. Mm. If you've got a conscience, a conscience, you're not going to want to do that because you're not going to want to sleep with women and then that kind of like lead, even though it's all consensual, don't get me wrong. And this is why it's not about legality, it's about morality. And that comes with character because it's very easy to teach or for someone to think, oh, from a legal perspective, or, F, or I'm okay because she wanted it. But if you know that, okay, if I'm going to bring her into this world and teach her things that she's never known or experienced before, and more than likely she's going to be, want to be attached to me and I don't want that, it's best that I don't go there. Yes. Now, again, that's, some, that's something that you know from within. No one can tell you that. Because if you were to ask your friends or your boys, they'll be like, no, you haven't done anything wrong. Slap mm. you in the back. No, you, did, you showed her a good time. But you know inherently that it's wrong. So that's, what, that's why, again, it comes down to character. And, and that's why when I think, okay, even for myself, even though I was very wayward, I had moral characters around me that that instilled something in me that you know something is wrong. Character is not um, people telling you, so when you when no one's looking, when you know, when, mm. you just, when you're checking on your heart and think that checking on your conscience, that doesn't feel right. And that's something that even when, you know, you go through the phases of, or I was going through the phase of doing what I was doing and enjoying the pleasures of the flesh, and not to say that I don't do that anymore, I'm more aware of, okay, especially if, and, and I think most men we know, and I, people might say I'm generalizing, but I am. And, but especially if, you know, you, you know that a woman wants something more from the relationship, this encounter, mm. but you just want a, to go there. And, no, and to, you, I'm, I'm not going to start saying it's, um, I read, I saw a tweet and people said, uh, it's a form of sexual assault. If a man has sex with a woman consensually, and this is why it's very wild. Now when we speak about morality or sexual ethics, she said, if a man has sex with a woman, but a woman consensually, but the woman wanted a long-term relationship, but the man didn't, and he didn't disclose that, that sexual assault. And I was like, okay, this is where Ooh. it's getting, a bit, yes. I don't know if you've seen that tweet. It was about no. last year, it went viral. A lot of women were commenting on it. And it's like, because they were saying it's, it's sexual assault, it's emotional abuse and this, and that. And I was like, this type of conversation needs to be had, but it's very careful that you need to understand or explain what is assault what is do you understand what i'm getting yeah, at? because yeah, yeah, that's not that, and the, but in this day and age it's very difficult to have those that conversation because there's a lot of nuances and if yes if i'm going into and because this is not like um is it steeping or where you take off your condom it's not the yeah, same yeah but they're equating it with that mm. and that's where a lot of and i was just like oh this is very dangerous but even to have that conversation when i was speaking to a couple of my female friends um, that believed that or that agreed with this particular tweet, they didn't even want to hear it because they had been hurt. Yeah. And they would just speak. It's, it's, and it's like, okay, I can understand it's wrong, like morally or ethically, but to say it's sexual assault and, to, and it's very difficult to prove as well. Yes. Um, and this is, and this is where I think even having these type of conversations where men can articulate themselves because you have some men who are, you know, because, you know, maybe butter wouldn't melt in their mouth or they're, you know, pretending to be something that they're not, they would never do such and such a thing. They would never, they, are, they could understand why a man would do that. Those type of men, whilst it's women, we, or it's good to prop them up, they're not actually, under, even if they haven't experienced that, they're not empathetic where they can understand men who may have done that. But it doesn't mean yeah. that they are people, do, do you understand, who've abused and assaulted women? And I just think yeah. those nuances and those great areas, that's something that if you're teaching men importance of character and ethics and morality they will choose not to do that themselves but it might take a while you know it's something that you kind of realize because a lot of men um it's after they've had a daughter or when they think about someone doing something to their sister that's when they realize i don't want to mistreat women i'm not going to call women bitches anymore like jay-z said but it's yeah. like okay so do you, do you did you need a daughter to realize that you should respect women so if you didn't have a daughter you still would be disrespecting women that's what you're saying even though you was married to a woman Mm. but that's just the reality with a lot of men and it takes a while to get to that um realization i wouldn't always put it down to age and it's not always necessarily down to experience but it's something that everyone's got a different clock or a different level of consciousness and i think characters is, is but the difficult the difficult thing with character as opposed to um um the difficult thing with characters it's difficult to measure and to compare with one person to another it's like with yeah. reputation you only really know someone's reputation after a number of years or number of experiences or when they've been put through difficult periods. That's when you really know someone's reputation. But in terms of how quote unquote good someone is in the bedroom, I can 
fool people by saying I've slept with X amount of women. I've slept with such and such beautiful woman. Therefore, people to assume that you're great in bed, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're a good person or a good lover or a good man. Do, do, do you understand mm-hmm. what I mean? So that's why mm-hmm. character is definitely the in most important thing, but it's very difficult to measure and to identify um, unless you kind of you know know of that person or know mm-hmm. of people that know of that person kind of thing. So. Mm. that's why it's not really spoken about i don't think because you can't really make money of that but i can teach you how to have character in this course i can't teach you that that's it can take a process especially depends where that person's at so like you said you already knew when you said you didn't feel right with certain things internally so even if you was doing a madness it just needs to be refined but imagine you're someone who you could be doing and we all know of men who done the most despicable things consensually again i'm talking about (laughs) but i don't see any wrong in it like there's some yeah. men like they can sleep with their friends girl and it doesn't bother them you know everyone has got some level of now nah, that's you've gone too far now imagine you're speaking to someone who like they're so solely obsessed with their own whatever they want even if it means breaking up families sleeping like i said with their their friends wife girlfriend what have you they don't care mm. we all know of men like that right so if you're trying to help that person you're coming from a very different position in terms of the coaching that they'll need in the training compared to someone who knows it's wrong but they still want to enjoy themselves because they're so young and they want to have a good life kind of thing or have a fun time so i think even those those kind of conversations or those um platforms or those spaces need to be created but and again i apologize if women are offended by this i don't think women would be able to understand because even just to understand it, they'll just be horrified by it. But a man can understand why a man behaves a certain way. It doesn't mean he justifies it. It doesn't yeah. mean he, you know, sees, he agrees with it or he's even done it, but he understands because he, he's either been in that position or he's he could have been in that position or he knows someone that was in that position and it doesn't make them an inherently bad person. So that's why I definitely mm-hmm. think, yeah, there's more, you know, men that need to kind of, I don't want to say be role models, but just be like your the name of your podcast the authentic self the authentic man and then because people will see you know the complexities and the flaws and there's good that some and anyone that you see or you meet you see that they do good they do things that you don't necessarily agree with or they do bad but overall still is a good person i can take from that person but if you're just want to have the perfect person that's always saying the right thing which is we often see on tv or social media when it comes mm. to men and, and relationships a lot of men won't be able to relate to that because they will feel like you can't even, you don't even know like what I'm going through because you're just this, you can't even identify or relate to, yeah. you know, the struggles that, you know, that I'm going through. And then if you, if they try and explain this to their partner, their female partner, their wife, girlfriend, what have you, she's horrified. What? You would, you would why would you want to sleep around with X amount? It's like, oh God, let me not even go there. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> No, it's yeah, true. Yeah. If, if someone kind of understands, it doesn't have, again, not agreement, understand, and this comes from like empathy, compassion, it's very difficult for that person to honestly help. Mm. And then what happens in some, again, I'm not a therapist or anything, but what I've listened to with some therapists is that, especially um, therapists that haven't experienced that, so maybe because they're women or what have you, oh, he must, he, they misdiagnose him, he's got this problem, he's got that problem. And it's just that, not necessarily he's got a medical problem or psychological problem. It's just that it might be a character flaw. Like there are some people, when it comes to money, you can trust them with your life. But when it comes to women, you can't trust them with a barge pole. Yeah. And there are some people with, with women, you can trust them. But when it comes to money, you can't trust them. And we all have people that we know or like that. And, and you, because you know the way they are, their weaknesses, you just maintain your relationship, but prevent them from maybe come doing business with them or, maybe bringing your go around them because they can't help them. Not that, again, that sounds like, again, I have to be careful with my words. Because you understand me, I'm speaking more freely. If I was speaking to someone, I'll be, oh God, let me make sure I say it. Because are you trying to say that, you know, men, you know, can't control themselves? And then, so uh, I'm policing my language, I'll be policing my language, I don't have to do it with you, fortunately. And anyone listening, hopefully you'll get the gist and understand what I'm getting at. This is a problem with language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The problem with language is, is it's very limiting in our expression. Yes, very. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So great points there about character, actually. And then, like you said, I see this with my, with my coaching that, you know, I feel quite blessed that the men that come to me are good men who want 
the best for themselves and the women that they come into contact with. And I think that's an interesting thing because um, often women talk to me and go, oh my God, I meet all these terrible men doing these terrible things. And I go, well, you know, these men exist. I was like, but I, they don't come to me with my message because my message is a message of let's connect this, this love and so forth. So it's, uh, it's very true that the, the, the men of that character are always going to be harder to reach because they see the fruits of how they are now and they don't necessarily see yeah. the fruits of how maybe they could improve. But yeah. I wanted to, to get onto the uh, different topic. One of the other things you mentioned before, which was Kinyaza, right? Which is this amazing practice that I'm sure the listeners are like, what, what is it? What, you know, how, how yeah. does it work? Um, yeah. So I guess the, the question of is like, what is the practice of Kinyaza and, and what is its history? Sure. So according to Rwandan legend, there was a queen who was, I mean, this goes back to like, I think like the 15th, 16th century. Um, her husband was, the king was away in a military expedition and she was yearning for some special attention, shall we say. So her loins was, was very hot. And she summoned one of her guards to come and make love to her. Now the guard at this time, he was petrified and obviously he was worried about the king. If the king came back, he may kill him or execute him. And then she demanded, if you don't make love to me, you're going to be executed. <laughs> so as he approached her, he started to shake. And um, as he was shaking, as he was shaking and he was holding his, his penis, his manhood, it was striking against her vulva, her clitoris mainly, and uh, her labia. And from there, it was said, a large gush of water emanated from her loins and Lake Kivu, which is one of the largest lakes in uh, East Central Africa, was formed because of this, wow. this, this tradition. That's, that's how the tradition is, is taught. And then when the king came back from his military expedition, she then taught the king, this is how I want you to make love to me. It's not just about penetration. I want you to make sure you tap your manhood with on my Urogongo, which is the clitoris in, in the Rwandan language. So that's one, that's the most popular story. There is, there is another narration of the story which is taught, which is that the queen was, again, her husband was away on a military expedition and she started to play with herself and she was tapping, she was using her finger to tap her Urogongo, her clitoris, and from there, a gush of fluid emanated from her loins and Lake Kiva was created. So in both versions of the story, what's really interesting is the cent central character is a woman mm -hmm. and it focuses on obviously women's pleasure and then the men and even with myself, even I'm trying to improve my language when I'm speaking about, it's not about making women squirt or making women ejaculate, it's helping them squirt or helping them yeah. ejaculate and it's facilitating. So a lot of women I've got the I believe a lot of women have the capacity and the capability of orgasming squirting ejaculating but for different reasons whether it's because they're unable to um um connect with their mind and their body if, whether it's because of maybe shame that they might feel because of you know if they were to squirt or they're not comfortable with themselves or maybe might be an incompetent lover there are a number of reasons why a woman is not able to let herself go and experience whether it's climax squirting or ejaculation so for me, that was one of the really interesting things that the central character was obviously a woman focused on women's pleasure. And then from there, that tradition has been taught from generation to generation, primarily by women who are known as Sengas in Eastern Central Africa. Um, in Kenya and Uganda, the Kunyaza tradition is known as Kachabali, whereas in Rwanda, it's known as Kunyaza. The water that emanates from her loin, from her urethra, that's called Kunyara. So Kunyara refers to the water, ejaculation, the female ejaculate, and then Kunyara is actual technique. Now, since obviously that story was told, it's developed somewhat as in now with the sex educators or sengas, when they're teaching women, they also teach them another tradition called, which is controversial, tradition called Gukuna, which is labia elongation, where they teach women to kind of like elongate their labia. Now, again, I'm not from West, I mean, East Central Africa. It's not for my cultural practice to kind of get involved in, in labor elongation it's not something that i naturally naturally would endorse but i respect that that's their cultural tradition and for me it's the kunyaza tradition that i'm more focused on and again some of the benefits not only has it got the reputation of helping women climax and squirt within like five minutes also it teaches men the importance of sexual discipline mm. because is focusing on her pleasure and as, as a man generally especially in the western world where the sexual script is straight to um, intercourse and the jackhammer approach because of what a lot of men have seen in porn and we know that in most cases most women require clitoral stimulation in order to climax this is like a, a technique or a practice that is teaching men the importance of 
ensuring that her clitoris is sufficiently stimulated. And obviously that's a technique which obviously a lot of people are obsessed with, but there is the, the psychology behind women's desire and kunyaza is just as important, if not more than the sexual technique, which oftentimes people forget about because they just think, okay, if I do this tapping technique, she's just gonna like gush waterfalls. And it doesn't work like that, especially if the woman is not mentally ready, if she hasn't psychologically prepared herself to receive this pleasure and allowed herself to squirt or allowed herself to climax. And also if the man is not patient and attentive to her needs. So this is all part of the process when the, you've got the women who are teaching the younger women and then you've got the men who are known as kodjas, like their sex educated uncles who are teaching the younger men and even some older men as well. Because this idea and what I found was really refreshing as well is that Kunyaza was taught not only just to like young men or adolescents, it was also taught, taught to grown men. And, and it's emphasised continuously because for some reason, especially in the Western world, people look at like sex education starts and stops in childhood or maybe adolescence but when you're an adult i don't need sex education anymore it's, like, it's for children where in reality when we're speaking about sex education or relationships we all are on, on for me we're all on a journey where we're learning we're learning new things about yeah. ourselves we're learning about our partner we're learning about our different experiences but for some reason I, again i think people feel that edu I've, I've been educated when i was in primary school or secondary school and i don't need to i know how to have sex so therefore there's nothing else that you can tell me so that's why mm. Even with the title of the book or the subtitle, I called it The Secret to Female Pleasure as opposed to female squirting or ejaculation or orgasm because the ultimate goal is with Kunyaza is about women's pleasure. So whether she squirts or not, whether she orgasms or not, whether she ejaculates or not, the, the aim is that she is sufficiently satisfied, that she enjoys satisfaction, she enjoys pleasure. And if that's something that people adopt, especially um, us in the Western world where we're very much focused about you know, goal oriented to orgasm sex. If a woman does orgasm or squirt, you feel like a failure, both the man and the woman. So there is, mm. although there's been um, the practice being widely well received, there's still this idea, this pressure that people are placed on themselves, which is not something I'm trying to. And that's why I don't always talk about squirting, 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 even though that's something people are intrigued by because they feel that, okay, I need to squirt now. And it's like, no, you don't need to squirt. And it might take a while. Um, there's people that, you know, have read my book and obviously attended my watch who, who report that they have been able to squirt. That being said, please, if anyone's listening, do not send me any. Like, I don't need evidence for it because I do receive some wild messages and pick, I don't need to see evidence. <laughs> you don't need to confirm or verify. There's no like certification. I'm not doing any of that. It's just <laughs> imparting the knowledge. You do with it what you want, right? So <laughs> it's not that I need to validate anyone's Kunyaza experience or give them like the um the stamp of approval or anything like that um but it's just for me like i said it's empowering because it's teaching men to center and to prioritize women's pleasure and it's giving women a position where their pleasure is prioritized and i just think that we don't really hear many narratives and stories about that so like i said the, but the tradition itself has changed somewhat and there's different sex positions that people can incorporate with kunyas and also it's encouraged that people also engage in different sexual acts in addition to the technique whether it's um slow penetration whether it's cunnilingus different things but ultimately it's all about prioritizing and ensuring that the woman is satisfied mm, this is really really beautiful and i think the the thing you talked about sexual discipline is something that i i come to study tantra maybe three or four years ago mm -hmm. and a central part of what i was learning was like you know it's very important for a man to be disciplined in his sexual urges so that he's he has power over his urges instead of his urges having power over him which is a, a lot of the case for most men is that they yeah. they start to to get the urge to to ejaculate right to to bus as you know i i said in my, in my years and there's no most men don't have that awareness and consciousness to go i'm going to slow down or i'm going to stop and not allow that happen and that that's a tiny bit of discipline that i always say I implore my coaching clients, even when I talk about dating and relationships to, to bring in, because when you can have that power over that, that bit of discipline there, right? What, what other discipline could you instill in your life? Which I think is a, is a really huge thing there. But also you talked about sex education, right? And a lot of us, and I think that, I think I was talked straightly to men. I think a lot of men are like, I don't need educating because I'm a man. I can do sex. I'm great at sex. And you hear that from a lot of guys. I don't, I don't need no help. Um, I see this with my friends sometimes, actually, and then they see the workshops I'm running. But as you said, 
it's a continual learning. Like I, you're always learning something. I'm sure you are still now after writing the books you've written and reading and, and being in the places you've been, you are still learning. And the same with me, I still read plenty of books. I still um, watch podcasts because I'm always learning. But a lot of people have this idea with sex is like, oh, I can do it. That means I know everything I need to know. And actually that really limits um, our sexual experiences because they don't evolve. It's like if you learned to be a plumber 25 years ago and he said, well, I learned to be a plumber. I don't have anything new to learn because I learned. And it's very ego driven, isn't it? It's very much like I know everything. And it's very fragile because, you know, you have to hold on to this idea. You have to protect this idea. And it often means for, for a lot of men that they never delve into the importance of sexual, uh, female sexual pleasure, right? As you said, because it's all very much very penis central, right? That's how we're taught sex education at school. It's like the penis goes in the vagina and that's done. That's literally sex education when I was at school. But actually, there's just so much more. And there's actually pleasure for men in this, right? There's a huge pleasure for men to be with a woman who is deeply pleasured, who is ecstatic and so forth. And I think that's the part that a lot of guys forget. But I think what gets in the way is, is ego, ultimately. This, this fear of not being good enough, the fear that they can't pleasure their partner. So they would rather never learn than actually be able to really bring their partner to those sorts of heights. Yeah, I agree. I think you hit the nail on the head with something which you said, which I caught. Um, <clears throat> and I think, but we, I don't know how we would we can go from, I'm going to try and explain what I'm what, what, When you mentioned about sexual experience, which... I think that's the cornerstone. If we understood, se- it's ra- if we replace sex education with sexual experience, we have a very different attitude towards mm. sex and pleasure. And the reason being is because if you're just thinking about sex education, it's what, when you think about education, it's informative, it's instruction-based, it's mechanical. It's telling mm. you what you need to do. Everyone, well, those are, every, people have had sex or have had plenty of sexual partners. There's nothing else that you need to tell me because I've had multiple sex, with multiple sexual partners, in different positions so i've ticked all those boxes whereas if you talk about sexual experiences everyone will realize we're always evolving and always always expanding and it's always something to learn and even the most egotistical man will realize that like you said what i experienced at 25 is very different to what i would experience at 45 or what i experienced mm-hmm. with a woman at 25 is very different from a woman at 45 even that same woman because your experiences will always change but because we're just in this day and age or this society it's very like Again, that's why it's like it's ha- but it, but it's just how do you communicate that in a way where they can understand and grasp it? Because if you mention sex education or sex, yes, they'll look at like I've had all of the positions, I've done all of the positions, I've read karma which I've done this, I've done that. But if you're talking about experiences, which is always expanding and it's always changing, and in order to understand or to really appreciate a, a legitimate or valid sexual experience, it's not just about you, it's about your partner. So it's yes. all well and good saying you've had done X, Y, and Z. But has she experienced X, Y, and Z? Now, you wouldn't know that unless you've communicated with her. And the reality is that for a lot of men, even if you've had a number of numerous sexual partners, do you honestly believe that they've all had those great, wonderful sexual experiences that you think they would have had? Because you haven't developed mm-hmm. a connection with all of those women. It's more or less yeah. impossible. So but if you're talking about sex itself, like sex education, then of course a man will say, I know it all, because I've had sex educate I've had sex with all these women and I've had an orgasm with all of these women so of course it's been great but then if you expand mm. the conversation or sexual experiences and it's mutual then all of a sudden I think a lot of men will be like actually let's change the subject because they'll realize that the ego is going to be tainted and you realize you don't know as much as you thought you did that's the reality and the more you know when we speak about experiences you're always going to be humbled the same way when you're traveling to different places and learning different cultures, speaking to different people, you realize what I knew is not, I don't know as much as I thought I did. Yes. And it always humbles you. If you're someone that's a student of like history, a student of knowledge, and you're appreciative of these type of things, you'll always be humbled because there's always something that you can learn. It's all with them. Until you, until you from cradle to grave, there's always something to learn. Whereas if you're someone that's thinking about quantitative experiences or quantitative um, acts, then I'm the best lover, I'm better than this person because I've had X amount of sexual compartments compared to that person. So that's why mm. I just think in, we need a cultural shift to kind of change attitudes towards sex where it's not just goal orientated, like you said, penis centric, and it's just a focusing on um, male's attitude. Because if you get a lot of men in a group and they're talking about their sexual um, experiences, it is going to be very, you can measure it. 
Whereas obviously with women generally, you can't measure it like as, as easy in terms of what they've experienced and, and, the, and the, the phrases and the words that they use. So if we can help men understand what women are saying and understand actually what they like, then you'll realize that actually you didn't, you wasn't as great as you thought you was in bed with all of these women because you didn't have the time. You wasn't able to connect with all of these women in such a short period of time in their transcendental, you know, casual relationship is impossible. Mm. And when you kind of really like I feel into that, it's like a man's sexual experience is very external. It's very obvious mm. and clear, right? Or we're taught that it's very obvious and clear, right? We get erection, we ejaculate. And, but for a woman, everything's very internal, right? You know, other than if they're the squirting, and that's probably why men get yeah. so egotistically hooked onto squirting because it's an external validation of their internal experience. Well, they think it is, right? Because squirting and orgasm are not necessarily the same. But for a woman, everything happens inside of her. You know, she, she feels everything internally. So for a man to care or know how she's feeling, he can't measure it by his own pleasure. He must enter her world to a certain degree. He must be willing to feel into her world and understand what she's feeling to understand what she's feeling and know that she's having a, a beautiful co-created experience. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of men lack is that it's almost a level of, of empathy, like sexual empathy. It's something that I talk a lot about. It's like when you're with a woman, is do you spend the time when you are with her inside her to feel what she's feeling and get out of your own head? Because I think that's mm -hmm. where we get locked into this thinking about what do I need to do next? What's the, you know, how's this going? And actually be really present to be like, what's she feeling in this moment? And I think mm -hmm. that's a really beautiful step for men. I know it's a hard step because, you know, men and their feelings are not something that we are taught to feel, but when we can kind of evolve into that, and it not being a step-by-step -step thing, then we can start to enter into a woman's world and the world of her pleasure and what's going on for her. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that. And I couldn't have said any better myself. I just, yeah, what very well said. I mean, just to butter us that point, I'll just say, um, not to sound too crude, but we need men, as men, we need to stop viewing women as just as our cum buckets. And yeah. that's something that, even like I said, with a lot of men, and we know this through you know, discussions that men honestly have offline, um, they're not interested in women's pleasure. And that's a sad state of effects. Like they're not in, as long as I've slept with her, as long as I've, you know, banged her, whatever term they want to use, that's it. That's that I've, I've done the deed and she should be satisfied. Mm. And it's just interesting that with a lot of men, in terms of understanding women's internal experiences and things like that. A lot of men, I'm talking about heterosexual men, because this can sound quite wild. They're more interested in the internal experiences of validation from their male friends and the woman that they're with. Yes. The reason why I say that is because they want the validation, they want the acceptance, the loyalty from male peers or men that they respect. So they, they're more concerned with what they think mm. as opposed to the woman that they're named with. So they're still heterosexual because when I raise this, some women are like, oh, they're gay. No, they're not gay. It's just that this idea that they we have to these men need to view and appreciate women as sexual erotic beings, not just like someone that I can sleep with, like if that makes sense. Someone that's just going to, you know, hold hold hold, hold my semen. And it's a thing where, again, it's a cultural thing because not all men have that because it's, it's it's in some parts of the world. Even like the whole idea of I'm going down on a woman, it's still very much to this day. It's not only young men because I used to think it's a it's a young mindset. There's still men that in their 30s, 40s, and what have you, who have this idea that I would only go down on a woman if I'm going to be in a long-term relationship with her or, or she's like, or she's my wife. Whereas if it's someone yeah. I'm having casual sex with, there's no way I'll go down on her. But she has to, I, I would expect her to go down on me. And it's like, because again, this idea that me to just prioritize her pleasure, no way. And even men will mock and laugh a man that has gone yeah. down on a woman. But she hasn't gone down on him, and even if they didn't have sex, because it's like, so you just pleasured her. And and these are grown men in like in their 30s, yeah. 40s. I've heard this a number of podcasts. And it's always baffling to me that it's like, okay, so you're laughing at a man that wanted to pleasure a woman. Mm. That, that's what you're laughing. But because again, it's this idea that sex is just about me, like me as the man, irrespective of what she's feeling. And so if I sleep with her, I have intercourse with her, then that's fine. Well done to you. If she goes down on me, well done to me again because I'm pleasured. But if I just pleasure her and I don't receive anything in exchange, then 
I'm a lesser than a man. Not even why would mm. I'm, which is just really interesting that trying to, and I think even in those circles when I'm hearing this in different podcasts, men aren't checked. So I'm not everyone thinks like that. So because they're not checked, like even because then I think I think people realize that actually that just sounds crazy. Do you understand what I'm, what I'm getting at? I, totally. I think that I think because men aren't checked and people just like laugh and pat each other on the back, then I think then even men even that are maybe they obviously going down on their partners, but they would never admit it because they fear, you know, what other people, other men might say about them kind of thing. And it's just, mm. to me, it's just really strange. And it kind of puts this, this idea almost like during sex, sexual experience, you're having a woman, it's like a point scoring system and that you should yeah. always come off on top, which is very, um, very kind of, and I, when we talk about the patriarchy, I always talk about, I say we take patriarchy, but it's this very immature masculine way of being, isn't it? It's a competition. We're having sex in this competition and I need to get more than I put in. You know, it's this idea that I need to take more than I give. And if the man is a giving man, right, in some way he's lesser than, he's maybe being taken advantage of, that you shouldn't give. Giving, there's just something inherently wrong with giving and not obviously receiving, right? And that's a, a really interesting way in which a lot of our, business functions and in all sorts of ways isn't it when we start to look at it from from that point of view but you make a really a really good point about men aren't checked because if you are in a group of men and one man says oh yeah I went down on her but you know we didn't have sex and everyone starts mocking him if you're that one man there who goes hey I kind of agree with him you you suddenly become the end you at the other end of the mocking as well yeah yeah I've seen it a number of times even when I um, was in uni I'm not going to say the name of the artist because now this yeah but I was inspired to go down on a, on a girl I was seeing and then when I mentioned it and then they were making fun of me oh that's why you got pink lips this and the other at the time I didn't think anything of it right mm. I didn't think anything of it and also because I'm not from and I know there's some cultural element to it so I know in um I think it's in Jamaica and some parts of the Caribbean it's kind of seen as less than a man and I think there's some there might be some religious connotations to it, like the story of Onan or something like that, that is kind of seen as a, a form of sodomy. So, yeah, with all due respect to, you know, people of those cultural, religious traditions, I can understand if they come from that perspective, even though I disagree with it. But I, I never could understand why a lot of men always are more concerned, or generally are more concerned with what other men are thinking in terms of their bedroom activities as opposed to the women that they're with. I've just never really understood that. I've never, you know, and that's something that, that's something that I struggle with because, again, these are straight men. These are not um, homosexual or anything like that. So, because some women are like, oh, it's homoerotic. It's like, no, it's not. It's just, again, maybe it's a form of validation or acceptance. And that's, again, because in terms of who defines masculinity, what is to be a man, it's generally other men. It's not, you know, it's not generally a woman. So, if they're looking at these men who can define it, this is what is like a good man or a strong man or an alpha man, however you want to call it, that's what they kind of, they're going to subscribe to those kind of ideals. And maybe because, I grew up because it took a lot of while the time for me to really think and reflect that I've been in different environments where I've seen a different side that is expected like as a man to provide the same way like financially I'm quite traditionalist in the sense that with my woman I pay all the time and I'm expected now some people will be like no you can go 50 50 yes you, she works you can, but I'm expected that's kind of see it as my role so to speak as a man that's how I was raised I've been conditioned now someone who wasn't raised that way they might look at it like, why are you as a man want to always front the bill? As egotistical, it's like, no, that's just part of my duty as a man. The same way it's part of my duty as a man to satisfy the woman that I'm with. It's just, mm. to me, it's just a non-start. It's just that that's what you're expected to do. So it's always interesting, like I said, learning and speaking to different people who come from different perspectives and then try to get them to understand that, okay, do you not think this might be a bit problematic? Because some men don't think it's a problem. Yeah. That's where it's an issue. If a man doesn't think it's a problem and the woman is silent, and that's why even with some of the work that I do, I always try and tell women that you need to empower yourself. Don't wait for other people to empower you. So yeah. it's not this idea that I'm speaking amongst myself or my girlfriends. No, you need to speak to him. You need to tell him. You need to demand what you want in the bedroom or tell him because otherwise he might be none the wiser. Not every man is going to be attentive and empathetic to kind of ask and really understand or try to understand what your needs and desires are. So it's something that if, and I think with a lot of men, because we're nine times out of the 10, getting what we want in terms of sexual gratification and climaxing, 
there's no real need for a man to intuitively try and find out what the woman wants when she doesn't, unless she says it or he's not in a culture where he's telling him this is what you're expected to do, if that mm. makes sense. So that's probably, I, I imagine, some of the work that you're doing might be quite to attract those type of men. Because if someone knows something is wrong, of course I will reach out. But then it's those that something is wrong, but they can't, they don't know why it's wrong, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the, it's the situations where they know, they feel like, especially if in a relationship and they start to see the sex in relationships start to dwindle mm. and they're afraid to have the conversation. And I, they, they often will come to me like, you know, this is the situation happened in my marriage or in my relationship. It started to go down. And I instantly go, okay, cool. Are you enjoying the sex? And this is a really interesting one with men. Are you really, are you enjoying the sex as it is? And most of the time, the men, they say, not really that much. You know, I'm not enjoying it that much. And I'm like, is your wife enjoying it? And they're like, well, I don't know. We don't talk about it. And it's like, okay. And I always, my, my one of my first ports of call in these situations is like, okay, how do you discuss your emotions and your feelings with your partner? Do you talk openly about what the two of you are feeling? And nine times out of 10, there's like, no, no, no. We don't really talk about certain things. I'm like, okay what are the resentments that's in the way? Like, I think there's a certain magic that people don't realize is that if you're in a relationship and your sex starts to dwindle, right? Where are the unresolved arguments, resentments and problems that you're not addressing, right? Go straight there, talk about them, hash them out, come to a good resolution and the sex will start to fall into place, right? Because mm -hmm. when we can talk openly about our emotions, right? One of the things we're gonna talk about is our sex and our sexual satisfaction. But if they've got these unresolved resentments and, and, and annoyances that are in there, you know, talking about this quite vulnerable topic of the sex is, is not going to be the thing we're going to be talking about first. Mm. No, I agree. That's, that's so true. That's so, that's so true. That's so true. Do you find, um, so I'm interviewing you, but I'm just intrigued by your work. Do you find um, like married men, generally speaking, to be more challenging or people in long-term relationships as opposed to men that are like casually dating, seeing like in terms of trying to open up with their partner. Cause I've, I, I, I've, I've seen that men that are in long-term relationships or married, like in committed relationships, those that have issues, it's harder to come out of it than those who maybe like have casual relationships. Is this something that I've kind of noticed recently? I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. So if they Why do you think that is? Um, I think because if they're single, and they're going into relationships, they get a blank slate each time. They can start again. It's much easier to meet someone new and go, this is who I am, than in your existing relationship to start to shift who you are because the other person is also attached to who you were. So it's like, you're gonna actually meet resistance from your partner in some way, right? So you're gonna find that you start opening up about your emotions, for instance, maybe she can't hold space for that, right? And when you do say, oh, I'm upset, I'm sad, because of these existing way in which she sees you, plus any existing resentment, you might, you might be emotionally attacked for opening up. So it takes a lot more work to, to come together in that. Whereas if you're, you're single, you meet someone new and you're like, hey, you know, I am really nervous tonight. They will accept that because they're like, this is who this person is and you can move through that place. Wow, that's true. So would you advise, and is this something that you do like, um, I don't know, is it pre-marital or pre-long-term relationship counselling? Because it's harder work, like you said, when you're in that situation. Now, obviously, those who are in that situation, you know, they have to deal with it. But I'm talking about those who are not in that situation, but are unaware. Like, I'm just thinking, how can you attract or how to pass that message? Because I, I do agree with you, but how do you pass that message or connect to them that they realise they need to kind of, identify and be able to open up and like show those vulnerabilities with their partners like do you have like courses or events that you do beforehand because I because honestly the amount of men that are married or in long-term relationships that that you just described a number of them and they, they feel like they're stuck and they don't know how to come out and so it's, and they will be met with, and they are met with resistance with their partner I just don't know like how to like again, I just give a few words of advice. I just say go and find someone because that's not really my really me. I'm just a book seller. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I'm just, <laughs> yeah. I'm just I'm just wondering, like, how do you like? Because again, especially I'm just thinking with the average guy who's single, he doesn't really think he's got an issue because he had X amount of partners, this and that. But how do you equip them to kind of build them to they understand that they can be in a position where they can sustain 
um, a healthy relationship and at the same time still be vulnerable. Mm, so the, the thing is, is what I find with men is we, we grow through two things, I think, inspiration and pain, right? You know, I meet you and I'm like, ah, oh, I'm inspired by this man. I want to learn some more things, blah, blah, blah. But as men, we generally learn through pain, right? Men have this tendency because we leave things and we don't deal with them. So we go with pain. So often with, with men in long-term relationship, I find that there is some pain. They have, they have entered into a very painful situation and now they're reaching out for help. And at that point, it's usually depression, it's job loss, like all sorts of things like that. And it's like a rebuilding process of like, let's start you. A lot of time is like when it comes to emotional connection with our partners, the first thing we have to do is look at the connection we have with ourselves and our own emotions. So if you start to nurture an understanding of what we're feeling, like, okay, what am I feeling today? I'm feeling sad and happy. Like I use the emotional wheel a lot. It's like, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling happy. And start accustoming ourselves to just acknowledging for ourselves what we're feeling and start bringing in the language and then start talking to maybe a trusted friend who you know will accept you you know maybe everyone's got a friend who's a bit more open than them that they can talk to so start with that person can you talk to that person maybe even with strangers like you go to a coffee shop and there's someone behind the till and they ask you how you are say really how you feel maybe today you know you're feeling a little bit down and start there and start those little processes or and then with the partner is starting to um open up about what we're feeling over, you know, smaller things and talk about those things. But also I say a lot is like, start asking your partner how they're feeling. How is she feeling? Ask her about what she's feeling or whatever she says to you, right? It's not personal. You listen, you, you be grounded, you breathe deeply and you accept what's being said to you and you listen to what's behind that. Because a lot of the time as men, we like, she's complaining about us not doing the dishes and we're like I did the dishes yesterday what's your problem and it's like no she's not telling you that you didn't do the dishes she's telling you that she, maybe she's saying she feels unappreciated or she feels that you know you don't uh, love her or care about her but when we learn to attune ourselves and listen to what's behind that it's like we respond to what's behind that and the woman with is like yeah I feel seen I feel heard and then we've connected on a more emotional level and it enables us to be closer and you know foster better relations I love that. Sorry, again, uh, another question. Why do you think there's a lack, there's not enough, or maybe a, there is, but I don't know of them, male or men speaking about like the stuff that you're speaking about in these spaces, like about relationships, sex, that, that a way that men can understand, not just women. Like, I'm just w- wondering why, why do you think there's a lack, or there's a dearth of men, sex educators, relationship experts, how, however you want to call it? I think one of the biggest problems is we school men in this idea that being in a relationship is bad in some way you're trapped we have a lot of negative kind of wording around relationships like I remember my dad telling me my parents aren't together my dad telling me all married people get when you get married you become boring I remember him telling me this and I remember thinking wow that's really your reality right so you grow up with words like ball and chain like if you go into the average pub and you listen to two English men talk about their wives They just sit and complain all the time. So the children hear this. We hear this through media, through television, right? So it's like relationships are bad. So men never school themselves in the the dynamics and artistry of a relationship, right? Let alone the the artistry in women and their feelings and how they move and how they want to be treated. So it it means that relationships are basically a place that are full of confusion to us. They're dangerous. We don't understand them. It's like a big black box that we don't really want to open. So... Mm you know, and I was like this for a lot of years and it's through my own pain (laughs) that I went out my way to learn and understand. And I think also when you look at in the media, it's like men's opinions about relationships almost don't matter as much, you know? Like I see my partner also works as a coach and and dating and relationships and she's featured in newspapers often and things like that, right? But when I look through these articles, they'll take five quotes and it's five women talking about dating and relationships and sex. There's no room for men because ultimately on the, on the other side of it is the readers who are reading these articles are women. And do they really want to hear from men to feel like they're being mansplained to a problem that's happening? And often these articles on top of that, do they really truly want to hear what, what's going on for men? Or do they just want to hear what validates their, they, what they think is already happening, right? Now that's something I see a lot is like, do you want to hear, I've, from time to time I take podcasts, actually very often I take um, 
podcast ideas from women who's said, look, this thing keeps happening to me. What's the man's point of view? Yeah. And so I, I do the episode and I talk from my personal idea of what I've experienced. And when I put those episodes out, women are like, my God, I never thought that men were having this experience. It's like, do you know why? Because you're just listening to other women who are angry at men and you've never spent the time to listen to a man who said, you know what? I ghost women because I have low self-esteem. I think they're going to reject me first. So I don't, or I, I'm afraid of commitment because my parents broke up and I saw a very painful divorce and my mother got hurt and I don't want to do that to a woman. But do most people want to really hear that from a man or do they just want to hear all men are assholes? Yeah. No, I, I think we need to, I need to interview on my own platform because um, I don't want to ask you more questions. But yeah, that's, no, I, I yeah. Like I said, I'll, 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 we need to, I need to interview on my platform and then we'll, we'll, we'll unpack some of what you just said. So <laughs> no more questions without you. <laughs> no, I just, I, I love, I have a lot of passion for these topics because I see men struggling, you know, I see a lot of men who want to be good men. They want to connect with yeah. women and they just, they struggle with the tools, like even sexually, you know, like I run workshops around, um, for, for, for men alone as well around things like foreplay um sexual uh performance as well as i have a workshop i've i did recently about masturbation mm. and because these are really important topics because we're not taught how to enjoy ourselves in sex and, and alone and also the women we're with and, and there are some men who want to learn but it's like it just takes a bit of time and the ego to kind of drop and they want to connect with women but the information isn't as easy for them to come across as it is for maybe women, I think, a lot of the time. I'm intentionally holding back because I want to ask some questions after when we have a because <laughs> I don't want to give you all of the content. Well, your viewers or yeah. listeners must know anyway, but yeah, we definitely need to... Um, I, I appreciate the work that you're doing and it's something that... It, it frustrates me, but then at the same time, you explain the reasons why, because I've seen the same thing that... There's a dearth of men speaking about these issues, but when a man does, it's always like, oh my God, I've never heard this before. And then what I don't want to create, even that's why I don't like to talk as much as I do, is then people feel you're only that guy that knows about men. It's like, no, there's a lot of men that are fully equipped, and but it's just that even A, they haven't been given the platforms to speak. And do you really want to listen to hear what the man, so maybe the tone might not be right, maybe the language, but a lot of what, I'm saying you're saying other men. It's it's sim. It's very similar, but mm. for for every reason, they don't want to hear it. But if it's women that's saying it, it's just like okay, I want to hear it because it validates what I kind of already think. So, and it's all it gets again. It's, it's very strange for me because even a lot of the podcasts, a lot of them are relationship based. Yeah, like in terms of the topic, the discussion topics. A lot of people, men want to know about women. Women want to know about men, but we don't want to hear from each other. <laughs> yes. And it, it happens in both. In, in, I'm not just saying that women do it, men do it as well. With the, you know, oh, yeah. there's a, the red pill space. Like they just want to hear about what this one did to me or that one did to me, and I did this to her. And it's like you don't really want to listen to the other side. And the same in the same case with women, I just find it. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. But yeah, yeah um, we definitely have to like. I, I need to interview you as well. Um, but yeah. I appreciate the work that you're doing and definitely keep it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. And I would, uh, would be my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, I guess after this wonderful conversation, the listeners are wondering where they can hear more from Habib, where you can find, find your books and your work. I know you have a Kinyasa <laughs> workshop coming up soon. Yes, um, I do have um, a workshop end of this month, the 30th of October. Um, it's going to be called The Psychology of Desire and Kinyasa. So I'm not really, I'm going to be touching on Kinyasa, but I'm also going to be looking at the different um, theories, both from a Western perspective and also looking at ancient traditions in terms of how do you, um, you know, sustain and rekindle design a long-term relationship and marriage, because that's something that's always something that people are struggling with, whether in a sexist mm. marriage, whether it's to do with withholding intimacy and understanding the reasons behind it and how to communicate desire effectively. Because I think that's something which not only about sex, because sex is one thing, but even desire and when you're not interested in sex or why you might have low interest, both the man and the woman, I find a lot of times couples find it very difficult to communicate with each other in terms of where they are and how to reconcile some of those differences. So, and I also want to normalize because again, having you know issues, I just think it's not it's not a big or shouldn't be such a big deal that people can't talk about it. So that's 
um, going to be the subject matter for yeah the next Kunyaza webinar on the 30th of October. Um, if people want to check me out on Instagram, Habib, H-A-B-E-E-B underscore A-K-A-N-D-E. Um, and then you can check my books out on Amazon as well. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. And I do highly recommend if you've not following Habib, he is very funny. His memes are very good. I feel <laughs> jealous of your memes because I am probably not as funny through my Instagram as I'd like to be. And that's come to Habib sometimes. I'm like, ah, oh, man, that's so good. <laughs> I might have to post this and credit him. It's that good. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, um, listeners. But yeah, I want to say a big thank you to B for his energy and his time. And he's a very busy man. Um, and yeah, listeners, I'm sure many of you have listened to this and you've, you've learned some very new things. And it'd be beautiful to hear from you. So, you know, reach out to myself or Abib and just say, you know, what is it that you've learned? Maybe there's something you've learned today you've been able to take into your relationship or your dating life. Like, let us know, because I know as educators, we put a lot of stuff out and we don't always hear as much back that, you know, how people have benefited from our work. And it's always beautiful to hear and it's always beautiful for you to share as well. But until next week, big thank you to, to Abib. And um, we'll listen to you. I'll speak to you soon. Ciao, ciao.